Well, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. The stranger sitting in the audience over there. Oh, hi, Mom. How you doing? <laughs> so I'm glad, uh, glad everybody made it. Um, actually, Terry, thanks for the message before. Actually, uh, my message may dovetail in partly into uh, uh, Terry's talk also because the topic of my discussion is the uh, what is the gospel. So um, we've all heard people talking about the gospel, about preaching the gospel or spreading the gospel. Well, what exactly is the gospel? One thing that I came to realize in, in dealing with people and talking to people Many people, even professing Christians, is they don't really know what the gospel is. They use the word all the time, but they really don't know what it is. Now, they, they know the meaning of the word, and, and we'll get into that in a minute, but they really don't know what the gospel is. But really, to understand what the gospel is, is really fundamental to understanding why Jesus the Christ or, as we like to say, Yahshua the Messiah, came to earth, uh, why he died on the stake, and uh, why he started the church. So, here's some quick I, common ideas of what the gospel is. Some people say the gospel is the story about Jesus the Christ. Some believe that it's um, his message about peace and love. Uh, still others say that they believe it's about the kingdom in heaven. Uh, some believe that it's about grace and forgiveness or the gospel of salvation. Well, yeah, we find that in some ways all of these things are part of the gospel, or they are, but there's actually more than just these things, and the understanding of what Yeshua, Jesus, meant when he spoke of the gospel will clear up a lot of understandings throughout the Bible. To understand the gospel, we first need to understand a few basic things. What does gospel mean? Who is Yeshua or Jesus? And why did he need to dwell among us and die? Who is Satan? And why did Yeshua start a church? Well, first we'll start with who is Yeshua. Yeshua Messiah, known to most people as Jesus the Christ, is the Son of God, or Yah. He was the God from the beginning at creation. He was there at creation. He created the animals, the man mankind, and he created, as Charles mentioned earlier, the seventh day the day of rest, the Sabbath day. Well, who then is God? Well, the word God was chosen by translators to describe the Hebrew word Elohim. And we know Elohim is a plural word denoting more than one. So as John 1.1 1, 1 indicates, he, Yeshua, the word, was Elohim and was with Elohim, the father. And they created mankind in their image after their likeness. So likewise, he, Yeshua, was there to call Abraham out of his native land. He was there to bring the children of Israel out of their Egyptian slavery. And he was there to give Moses the Ten Commandments and Mount Sinai written with his own finger. So later, he was the one who divested himself of his Godhead, of being Elohim alongside Elohim the Father, who he came to reveal when he came. He was born of a virgin, a young Jewish maiden, and dwelt among us as a common human being named Yahshua, or Yeshua, which means Yah's salvation, or Yah is salvation. So also note that in the Bible, whenever you see the title Lord in all capital letters, that it's a substitution for the name Yahweh, which Yah is a shortened form of and it's actually given to us in scriptures. 
So he is the word, the one by which all things were created. He is the one who was crucified and died on the stake for our sins and was resurrected after three days in the tomb to reestablish the opportunity that was lost in the Garden of Eden. That is for us to enter into eternal life under his coming kingdom, which he will be king of all at that time. So, now that we know who he was, well, who is Satan? Well, simply put, Satan is the adversary. He's the chief of the fallen angels and was once one of two protecting angels or covering cherubs, we're told. He was originally named Lucifer, which means light bearer. He was the one who eventually led the rebellion against Elohim the Father and Elohim the Son and their loyal angels. He was the one who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden and caused them to forsake their perfect relationship with the Father and the Son, Elohim and to lose their chance at eternal life under their kingdom. As, so, as this adversary, as he became the adversary, Lucifer was no longer called Satan, I mean, uh, Lucifer, <laughs> but Satan, which we said means adversary. And he's also called the devil, the dragon, the serpent, the prince of the power of the air, and the god of this world, right? It's the, uh, or this world, or this age, right? Uh, this is his domain in one sense, even though God owns everything. He's temporarily sitting on the throne of this age. So, he was the first of Elohim's creations to rebel against his kingdom. He had been striving ever since to pull away as many of Elohim's creation as he can into rebellion with him, and thereby denying them the opportunity to enter Elohim's kingdom, the kingdom of God. He's the spirit of rebellion, of usurping authority, of jealousy, of covetousness, right? Of deception, of dissension, of backbiting whispering behind the back. He is the dir in direct opposition to God's Ten Commandments based in love. So, I'll go over quickly God's Ten Commandments. I'm going to paraphrase them. God says, you shall have no other God but me. But he, Satan, made himself a God above Elohim and wants all to worship him instead of Elohim. Secondly, you shall have no images to worship me. Well, he deceives both pagan and Christians alike to use animals, nature, images, pictures, crucifixes, all as part of their worship, supposedly, of him. Third, you shall not disrespect my name, take my name in vain. Well, he causes both the non-religious and the religious, to swear or use God's titles or his name frivolously without proper reverence. We've all heard, gee, damn it, and all these things, and, and, and holy S, and uh, oh my God, and, uh, you know, in Britain, I think they use a, a bloody Christ, right? I think so, in Britain. So, he's the author of these things. Number four, remember to keep the seventh day sacred to respect me. But he, the adversary, has been deceiving people into accepting the first day. Uh, not only pagans, but also Christians to accepting the first day as the Sabbath day. The day of the sun gods, of the light bringer, Lucifer, instead of the true seventh day Sabbath. Five, respecting, respect your father and your mother. He causes children to disrespect and rebel against their parents, just like he rebelled and disrespected Yah, or God, showing no honor or special reverence to him. He usurps God's authority. Number six, you shall not murder anyone. 
He, the adversary, embodies the spirit of murder. Looking to destroy Elohim and the faithful angels, he inspires man to shed innocent blood upon the earth, even the most innocent blood, that of abortion that Charles mentioned a little bit earlier. Teaching mankind to take lives that do not belong to them because they belong to Yah. And he's the only one that could ever approve the taking of the life because he was the one that created it. Seven, you shall not have sexual relations with anyone but your spouse. But in a spiritual sense, this adversary cheats on Elohim by desiring and lusting after and worshiping someone other than God himself. Eight, you shall not take what is not yours. You shall not steal. But the adversary tried to take Elohim's throne and his kingdom. Nine, you shall not make false statements against anyone to bear false witness. Apparently, he, the adversary, influenced one-third of the angels to rebel by making false witnesses against Elohim, just as he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. Ten, you shall not desire anything that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to someone else. Well, he, the adversary, tried to take Elohim's kingdom, and he continues to attempt to take Elohim's creation, mankind, into perdition. So, now that we've identified the adversary, let's look at the gospel. Now that we have this backdrop to our question. So, let's first see the definition of the word gospel, which most Christians know simply means a good message or good news. That's basically, that's all it means, right? So let's look at some of the uses of this word gospel in the scriptures. We can see how people can believe that there are many gospels. The idea could come up that there are many gospels. Ephesians 1.10. In, that, in whom ye also trust, after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we see the mention of a gospel of your salvation. In Ephesians 6.15, we're told that your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Right? So now there's a gospel of peace. Romans 1.9 talks about, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Right? So now there's the gospel of his son. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And then Galatians 2.17, they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, and the gospel of the circumcision unto Peter. 2 Timothy 2.8 Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So Paul has a gospel. He has a good news also. Romans 16 25, again, we will see that now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So, Paul has a gospel or a good news. So, since the word means good news, you can give good news about just about anything, right? I have the good news that Yah healed me, right, of my ailments, all right? So the word, meaning good news, can apply to, apparently, a lot of things. But um, these examples, we, uh, but there is a specific good news gospel. 
the one that Yeshua, Jesus, came to preach. And we all know that in Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went into all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. All right, so there's the gospel of the kingdom. And likewise, Matthew 24, 13 and 14. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. For this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end come. So the good news of the kingdom, that's the main gospel. That's, when we speak about the gospel, that is the gospel. Terry touched on a lot of that in his, in his talk over there. But that's where the focus is, the kingdom. And we're going to see a little bit why that that's important. So, this gospel of the kingdom needs to be preached in all the world right up to the end. So the question is, did Paul preach a different gospel than the one that Yeshua preached? Well, no, because Christ is not divided. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And we know that from Matthew 12, 25, and Jesus... Through their, knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So, since we know that Paul can't be preaching a different gospel in Christ, let's look at some of Paul's writings to see if he was preaching a different gospel or not. We can start in Galatians 1, Verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So whose gospel is it? Well, it's Christ's gospel. All right? He's preaching Christ's gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Well, what would his gospel be? Well, that would be the gospel of the kingdom, the same one that Yeshua was preaching. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon, onto them. Ephesians 6, 19. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me, that I may open up my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, the good news, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. So what is an ambassador? <clears throat> an ambassador represents a kingdom. All right? So he's telling us right here, that that gospel that he's speaking of is the kingdom because he's calling himself an ambassador of it. Okay? So, 2 Corinthians 2.12 Furthermore, when I came to Taurus to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was open, un uh, open unto me of the Lord. So the gospel Paul was preaching was Yeshua's gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For, thou, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not yet, you have not yet, yet not many fathers. For in Jesus Christ I, ha I have begotten you through the gospel. So skipping down to uh, 19. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but power. So this gospel he's talking about is the kingdom of God. Acts 20, 24, where he says, So that I might finish my course with joy, the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom 
I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So this gospel that he's talking about is the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 9, 23. Um, oh, no, not, I'll skip that one here. Where was I? First, uh, First Corinthians 15, 1 to 24. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. And uh, herein ye stand. And then I'll skip down to three. For I delivered unto you first all of which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's a long thing, so I'm going to keep skipping down. But by grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Verse 24, then come at the end, and he shall, and he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So, this gospel, this gospel, any gospel that Paul's talking about, is, is tied to the kingdom of God. Now, every kingdom has laws. So that's what he was indicating in this last one in um, 1 Corinthians 15. Right? He's, he's indicating that, uh, that there's going to be an order. There's going to be an order in that kingdom. That there's going to be laws that are going to be followed. In 2 Corinthians... Um, I'm sorry. 2 Thessalonians uh, 1... Uh, five to nine, it says, which is, manif which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Let's see. So, oh, also, 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 11. But ye know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinner, for the unholy and the profane, the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that devile themselves with mankind. For man-stealers, for liars, for uh, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound document, doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. So that gospel is the kingdom of God and the laws that go along with it. So not only did Paul speak about this, but also Peter had something to say about obedience to the good news gospel of God, which is the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 4, 16 to 18, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is coming that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it begin first at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And what was the gospel? The kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God. And kingdoms have laws. So, finally, one last word on that matter. From the word himself given to John the Apostle. All right? And Revelation... And this will tell us what the gospel is. Revelation 14, 1 to 8. So I'm going to skip a little bit because it's a long segment. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 
144,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. Skipping down to four. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the good news, the good news of the kingdom of God, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying in a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her wrath and fornication. So yes, the good news of the kingdom of God is now established upon the fall of this world's kingdoms. It's all about the kingdoms, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, the putting down of the false kingdoms and the ruling of our king, Yeshua, our Messiah. So, there is one gospel, but there are different aspects to it. So don't let anybody deceive us. Yah is not divided. Paul preached the same good news as Peter and as Yeshua, and that is the gospel, the good news of the coming kingdom of God, which includes all the steps and aspects in bringing that kingdom about. It's the coming of Messiah, the one who will rule in that kingdom. It's also the peace that we have the assurance of in his kingdom, it's the salvation he brought by his sacrifice on the stake by his grace that allowed us to be in the kingdom. And it's the judgment that comes as he displaces Satan and this world's governments. It's all encompassed in the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. This all comes to fruition as we read in Revelation in the final establishment of the kingdom of God and all that is then delivered to the Father by Yeshua, who sits at the right hand of God. And our role, as he said in Matthew 24, 14, is to have this gospel of the kingdom preached into all the world as a witness. This is the purpose of the church. It's to have a people prepared for that day, for that kingdom, and also to spread the good news of that coming kingdom of God to all mankind. 2 Timothy 1, verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life immortal to light through the gospel. The good news of the kingdom of God. Praise Yah.